My name is Danny Gallagher and I am Process for Growth Consulting. Today we're going to cover a lot of concepts that will hopefully allow us to meet the challenges that we are facing in this new technology driven world. So on how we can retain our existing clients and turn them into our advocates and then how do we gather all the assets in motion. The good news is that the business model we employ and the value proposition we develop will help us accomplish both. PFGC is about standardization of all our processes, how we articulate ourselves, standardized presentations, discovery process, wealth management process, and finally, our investment process. Everything is interrelated, everything is interdependent, there are no thorough ways, everything counts. So this is today's agenda. What we have discussed are all interrelated and interdependent on each other but each has its own nuances that we will discuss separately. This is around investment management, but we all should realize that every aspect of our businesses needs to be upgraded. But a little context first. We are facing many new competitors, products, delivery systems, and services. In fact, there are over 15,000 financial startups, but it is much bigger than that. We are now, in fact, creating two and a half quintillion bytes of data every day. That's quite a lot. How much? It means we have created 90% of all data existing in the world today in the last two years and 95% of all data in the last three years. August 16, 2017 was an historic day as data surpassed oil as the most valuable commodity in the world for the first time in history. Every aspect of our lives is changing and so is the financial services industry. This conference is about technologies that enhance business models so we can be more efficient and effective in helping our clients. Accounting, risk, portfolio, wealth management are all here. But there are also technologies that are disruptive. What do I mean by that? Not all technologies are add-ons to our business models. Sometimes they disrupt our business models. Disruption is always a two-sided coin. In the year 2000, photography had a record year in every measurement. Cameras sold, film sold, prints made. Twelve years later, Eastman Kodak, who introduced the digital camera, went bankrupt. ATT, in the year 2000, asked McKinsey, how many mobile phones will there be in 2015? Answer, 900,000. Reality, 109 million. Landlines business, down substantially. Uber, as formed in 1999, came to New York City somewhere around 2010, 11, I think. At that time, a taxi medallion sold for $1.3 million. Today, you can't sell them for $250,000. Are there still taxis in New York City? Of course. Is their business model remotely the same? Of course not. Disruptive technology are a positive and negative force of nature. Disruptive technology has similar characteristics. One, they tend to be about 10% of the cost of whom they are disrupting. And second, they have an S-curve of adoption. The only difference is the rate of adoption has greatly accelerated as shown by the examples I just spoke about. What used to take decades now take five to ten years to disrupt. So we all know we are changing. The only question we have to answer is are we facing a disruptive technology and how can we meet this new challenge? Today we, FAs, are at the top of the mountain. Whether you are a senior financial advisor or a baby broker, on a team or an individual producer, in the business for 25 years or five months, have a CFP, CMA, CRPC, or CPM, or have no designations at all, run an investment model or not, we are the premium pricers in our business. We are on top of the mountain. Now at the business that is in a transition phase, there's a general perception that we are no longer value added for the fees that we charge, and that there are effective alternative methods of investing that don't entail using an advisor. I believe you have to think through two main continuums of change. First, our skill sets from a broker, financial advisor, to a holistic wealth manager with the proper designation. I believe it will take 10 years for us in the industry to attain the status of holistic wealth managers. Doesn't mean some of us are not wealth managers today or others employ some of the skill sets of a wealth manager. But on the whole, 99% of our revenues that we generate come from investment. The litmus test for me is that are we, if we are holistic wealth managers, 
are we prepared to move to an advice model like an estate planning attorney and CPA who's in charge of fee for advice? If not, I think we have a ways to go. Now, in my mind's eye, this is what PFGC does best, as we have developed transitional phases to help drive the process to wealth management. But there is an immediate threat. Whether we like it or not, we are paid by assets under management, not for wealth management. And it does and if it does take us 10 years to transition to a holistic wealth manager paid for our tax and estate planning advice, we need to deal with the reality that we are paid for assets under management today. We live in a world that our value proposition is being questioned. This is a real threat. We must adapt our business model, our investment process, so not only can we maintain our asset base, but we need to grow it substantially. Fees are compressing. We have to grow to maintain our lifestyle. We have to move now as the great movement of money we are experiencing will be lost opportunity for us to grow our books substantially. Issues in the new world. The two main interrelated topics are our fees and money in motion. Each one is driving our clients to reassess how they invest, with whom they invest, and how much do they want to pay in fees. We, and I mean all of us, have allowed the discussion to be defined without our input. We have to change the discussion while we change our offering to add value in the new world. McKinsey's report in November 2016 believes up to 8 trillion of investment vehicles will move from active to passive management over the next four to five years. This would be the largest amount of retail money in motion over the, la in the, next, over the last 40 years. The last big movement was Merrill's introduction, introduction of the CMA. I was at Payne Weber and we got killed. Retail manages about 22 trillion total. 8 trillion is an enormous amount of money of our assets when you consider that money market funds, individual stocks, and bonds and treasuries in our accounts. It is probably more like 70 to 80 percent of our money under management. Our opportunity and our job is to capture as much of these assets as possible while maintaining our existing clientele. Now, Moody reported in 2016 that the growth of ETFs will equal 50% of investable assets between 2023 and 2024 if you're using a linear progression. By linear, Moody took the last five years and extrapolated out of the next five years. But Moody says there's an accelerating factor that kicks in when there's a 30% adoption rate by the market, and this means that ETFs could hit 50% of market share as early as the first quarter of 2021. This doesn't mean that the ETF market share stops growing in 2021. It means ETFs will have 50% market share. An article in CNBC shows massive flows for 2016 and mentioned that Vanguard, under attack for their service, has had to hire 1,900 new people to deal with the inflow of assets. The reality is, is that money is moving to Vanguard and BlackRock in State Street. You haven't read any articles that money is moving to RIAs and the big BDs. This year is estimated that clients will buy up to $390 billion of ETFs, outstripping the last two years combined. The acceleration has already started. Next year, they are estimating that up to $600 billion will move to ETFs. Vanguard in the last 12 months has taken in $336 billion. iShares has taken in $191 billion. To me, the only discussion now is, is how do we insert ourselves as a value-added partner in this disruptive technology? Now, we have been dealing with new investment vehicles for 40 years, but this time there's a wrinkle. Moody notes on the previous slide also have implications for our business. Moody goes on to say that although a simple form of investment, ETFs are an innovative technology that allow investors to bypass the middleman, in other words, us. This bypassing of the middle person has huge implications on our ability to maintain our clients and our pricing power. Now, Moody calls it a disintermediating technology. I believe it's disruptive. With our fees compression, I believe that all assets are good assets. 
What is important is how do we manage them? I believe the firms are wrong on account size and this will prove that over the next few years. A big team interviewed me to engage me and they said that since they couldn't handle all their assets, their strategy was to get rid of some. What did I think of that? I asked them, well, what's the hardest thing to do in our business? They said, get new assets. I agree. So your business model does not allow you to effectively and efficiently manage all your assets. So the plan is to get rid of the assets that you feel are the hardest thing to actually do in our business. My question is, why don't you change your business model to effectively and efficiently manage more assets? This is the first slide I built around 15 years ago as I started thinking on how we needed to restructure our business model. If we were going to increase business development as a percent of our business model, then it has to come from somewhere. Since 82% of high net worth clients get their FA from a referral, I believe we actually have to increase our relationship management time and increase our skill set in that area. So how do we reduce the time we spend on our investments? Standardization. The investment process is very important, but we need to reduce the time that we spend on the process. To build a standardized investment process, it must have three attributes. It must be definable. What do I mean by that? We must be able to explain to a client or prospect, this is my investment philosophy, and this is how I execute against my philosophy. It has to be repeatable. This means that your investment philosophy is applicable to a large portion of your clientele. From experience, I can tell you it's almost impossible to apply one model to all your clients, but we have developed strategies to cover 70-80% with your investment philosophy. Scalable is simple. We must be on a discretionary platform. In today's world of global 24 by 7 and millions of a picosecond trading, how can we claim to be an efficient and effective financial advisor if it takes us months to rebalance our books of business? We can. Standardizing your investment process, I have found this terrifying for most of us. Today, we invest everyone's money a little bit differently. When you go from everyone is customized to a specific model for everyone for the first time where you can be held accountable, it is terrifying. Through experience, I have found that my clients don't understand basic modeling concepts. We have not worked with analytics on our portfolios. Why should we all, why should we, all our portfolios are different. And we don't work with comparison analysis. This is my investment strategy versus the one you are currently in. And we don't know how to sell a standardized investment model. We are managing larger and larger amounts of money, and yet very few of us have the certified portfolio manager designations, CPN. As one of my clients said, it's harder to become a beautician in New York State than a financial advisor. When we move to a model, you must understand that your model becomes an integral part of your value proposition. It becomes a weapon, and weapons can be honed. Let's look at the pricing pressures on our value proposition. Several industry changes are going to bring fees and costs to the forefront. At the end of 2014, a Fidelity study said that 20% of clients knew what they paid in fees. The study at the end of 2016 by Fidelity said that 33% now know what they pay in fees. Acceleration. The Fidelity study also says that the greatest threat to FA compensation is that in the first quarter of 2018, bond commissions and the company's fig will be put on each confirm. I believe there will be pressure on our bond commissions instantaneous, and it will be dramatic. Second, Merrill Lynch, and they are not alone, is introducing two data points on their statement monthly and year-to-date fees. It should be very interesting reading by our clients in November, December statements. So awareness that our fees is growing, transparency is increasing. Transparency and awareness usually means lower pricing. This is how I perceive the situation today, a three-sided relationship, clients, advisors, and asset managers. What we are trying to ascertain is how will our clients behave during this great movement of money? What I mean is, will they interact with us if they interact with us at all? If we compete on fees and not on value add, we will lose. We choose to compete on value added. We are not going to go down without a fight. Clients do need us, but we have to adapt to the new world. The title of this slide represents the dilemma 
and our opportunity. How do we talk to our clients about our value and keep them as clients so we can get paid? And then during this great migration of money, make our clients our allies and valued partners to people moving their money. Why do we need our clients as partners? 82% of high net worth clients get their lawyers, accountants, and FAs from a referral. I believe there are three possible interactions that we could have with our clients over these issues. They could call us on the phone or meet with us in, to discuss. Two, they could call our branch manager, <coughs> excuse me, and ask for reassignment. Or three, they could egg cat. I think if it's about fees, we could actually get the phone call. And my clients are now reaching out to me on a regular basis on how to handle a client request to lower their fees. It is anecdotal, but it makes sense to me. Clients have a relationship with us and will engage us on fees. Not always, but we have a chance for the phone call. On the last two, I am very unsure that we will get a phone call. We are the experts, the professional, and I don't believe our clients are comfortable questioning our expertise. Finally, and most importantly, people do not like confrontation. Most FAs I ask say the clients will just ACAT. This is why I believe whatever your strategy ends up being, it has to be proactive. One, to retain our clients, and two, that our clients become our advocates as money goes in motion. The biggest thing I have to say about pricing is this. If we had a crystal ball and we knew for certain that a $2 million account in five years would be priced between 30 and 50 bips, how would you talk to your clients today when they're asking you to reduce their fees? First, people are not calling us in a vacuum. This is a universal issue in for the next five years. People are reviewing how much they pay in fees and if we are worth the money that they are paying us. Look at all the articles and commercials dealing with the issue. They are everywhere and not many are defending our pricing structure. It is a real problem. Second, thank them for calling you. You're in the ball game. You have a chance. It is now a negotiation. What are the terms of agreement? I think about it now and don't wing it with every phone call. Be inventive, be flexible, but most importantly have a plan. If someone wants lower fees and you know they have another account, say, listen, I'll go to 60 bips, but let's consolidate the two accounts. I am hearing little noise on our existing clientele, but I expect that to be a new challenge and a great danger to our business. I strongly believe we need to be proactive. Clients are asked their negative or positive feelings towards four words, fees, commissions, charges, and costs. They all came back negative, but which one do you think we should use? I think cost works nicely, don't you? The point here is, how do we articulate ourselves and our cost to a client and prospect? I believe in the best possible terms. Next, Goldman Sachs ran a study on understanding how clients react to pricing points. Interestingly, they found that if a price point can be divided by 5, 10, or 25, the client was around 20% less likely to accept the price point. So you are more likely to have a client accept 81 bips versus 75 bips. The study was clear. They didn't understand for sure why this happened, but they felt that, must, that we must have a reason for the 81 bips, where the 75 bips seems like a throwaway. Vanguard issued a white paper on breaking down the components of our value proposition and understanding our worth. I had a couple of clients call me as we discuss pricing all the time to tell me Vanguard thinks we're worth more than 300 bips in value. So I had to read the white paper and Vanguard clearly states that the 300 bips is not an annual occurrence, that in fact our value is lumpy in their terms. By reading each component, it becomes evident there is a lot of value wrapped up in running a standardized investment portfolio, modules one, three, six, and seven. Then from the low cost investment vehicle, number two, and after tax performance, number five. I believe it is also evident it is an argument for a transparent pricing model because we have no way of capturing the 150 bips for advice, but that's for another day. On module one, where we get zero for our ETF allocation, I totally disagree with that, and we're gonna talk about that in this presentation. 
new sales cycle. The new sales cycle I heard for the first time on an HBR podcast. The professor actually used enterprise-wide software like Salesforce in an individual financial plan. Highly complex solutions that involve multiple concepts, expertises, and meeting to arrive at a proper solution. The internet, as we all know, has changed business models everywhere, so we shouldn't be surprised that our own businesses, business models, and sales cycles have also changed. I know I research everything online before I buy. I mean everything. So if you have a new prospect, isn't it reasonable for us to assume that the prospect has done research online on the possible solutions available to them and now come to the table with an opinion? As HBR pointed out, the prospect's opinion could be based on good information, bad information, or misinformation. It doesn't matter. What matters is the prospect has an opinion. Studies have shown that when two people sit down to discuss any topic that they have a difference on, a difference of opinion on, the part of the brain that is activated is fight or flight. This has huge implications for us. Fight or flight has well-documented physiological effects on humans. Although there are many effects, the two biggest for us is that peripheral vision decreases by 80% and our hearing drops about the same amount. In other words, if a prospect has researched the markets and different available solutions and now comes to the table with a different solution than the one you are proffering, we have an issue. The solution is rejected. HBR concludes that fully 50% of a sales cycle needs to be spent on telling the prospect why we invest the way we do, not how we invest. We no longer can be effective as the Wizard of Oz. We must pull back the curtain and have an open, honest, and transparent and professional discussion with the prospect. Relationship-based selling is about sharing lessons. That means mistakes and how you come to the decision that you did. No longer can we dictate. The goal now is to have a meaningful discussion on our investment philosophy so that in the end, you not only have a new client, but an ally in the new world of transitioning money. The new sales cycle is our answer to our problem of how do we become a value-added partner. Since we are being challenged by indexes, it is important for us to talk to our clients about indexes and why that index should not be used as a proxy for their portfolio. So the first point is, is that we build portfolios because they more closely resemble our lives as we attempt to meet our needs and goals. So it's important to talk about an index and why the comparison to their portfolio performance is valid, but with major flaws and caveats. You, Mr. Prospect, are a human being and you have needs and goals and a risk profile that do not necessarily sync up with any index, let alone the S&P 500. An index, any index, contains no cash. It has no life expectancy or needs distributions for college, second home, or putting a parent in an assisted facility. But we do. Expectations of equine performance of an index must be discussed in terms of a portfolio and risk-adjusted returns. I realize that an index is easy for our clients to understand and even easier to point to as a reference point to our success as a manager of somebody's asset. But an index does not take into account that we have messy lives and varying goals that do not easily equate to an index. Our needs and goals are better served through a prism of a portfolio. These are seven Vanguard ETFs, performances from 2000 to 2015. Two bear markets, two bull markets. I think a fairly good sample size. How did you do by firing your FA and buying the S&P 500? Index versus a portfolio. No one, no one index can substitute a well-built perform portfolio in performance and risk-adjusted returns. Not one. The concept of a portfolio versus an index is critical for us to discuss with our clients and prospects. The why. The concept of I'll just buy SPY or the Vanguard VFINX because it's simple, diversified, and low cost, which are all true statements, has inherent flaws and breaks down under scrutiny. Would you be a prudent manager if you invested the bulk of a client's money in any one of these indexes? No, of course not. 
But if I was running a sector-based core portfolio that entails, let's say, 50% of the portfolio in, in the S&P 500, would it be prudent to have 10% dedicated to the small cap value fund? You know, I don't have a clue. I would build my portfolio then to run the metrics to fully understand the implications on performance, dividends, and up and downside capture and risk-adjusted return. And then I would tell you the answer. Buying one index, any one index, is inherently risky and not in the best interest of our clients. I would never do it, and neither should you, Mr. Client. Do it on your own. Less than 1% of FAs executed in-depth discovery process. I have many clients who initially proclaim they have a great discovery process, but after engagement find that it's not adequate for relationship management. Fine for an asset manager, but not for a wealth manager. This is what we call your world. We reflect back to the client all the info graphically. I highlighted a couple boxes. If a person says I have $2 million to meet my needs and goals in 15 years, does he really with this discovery? What about the college for the two kids? The mother-in-law with dementia. My mother had slight dementia and we had her in an assisted facility for around $2,800. Her dementia got worse and the facility called and said we had to move my mother to the secure floor and the monthly fee would be $10,800 or we had 30 days to move her to a new facility. It tore our family apart as we did not have the money to stay. Discovery undercovers life events that we need to build into the portfolio so we can assist our clients in meeting their needs and goals. The first thing we're going to do is redefine what is a client's risk portfolio. Defining your client's risk portfolio will help us move the discussion from an index to a portfolio. Discussing how much a client is willing to lose by buying so-called risky stock is not a relevant conversation. Our discovery process should unearth potential weak links, i.e. life events, that could hinder or stop our clients from meeting their goals. By understanding life events, we can develop solutions that involve estate, insurance, and investment strategies. 82% of high net worth clients say they want all their financial uh, needs and goals addressed, not just their investments. Once we do understand the client's needs and goals, we need to be able to discuss with the prospect our investment philosophy to help them reach their needs and goals. This is not how we invest, but beginning the discussion on the why. Our investment philosophy is a high-level thought process, almost like developing an IPS, an investment policy statement. Value-added partner. This is my representation of the perception of investing today. Clients perceive that I can buy the SPY. I'm diversified. I can track the index. My expenses are lower. I do not need an FA. I certainly do not have to pay my FA as much in fees. I can use an inexpensive robo-advisor that use an algorithm. Basically, I can do it by myself or pay very little. ETFs are simple, diversified, low cost. I don't need advice on the way to invest. My lion, does this not sum up the commercials and advertisement? Perceptions are rarely reality. Yep, the SPY represents the S&P 500, which is actually made up of 500 stocks, hence its name. But actually, the two largest S&P ETFs contain 510 and 504 stocks. I know this seems silly, but the Wilshire 5000 is actually made up of around 3,800 stocks. The SPY is S&P is also divided into 11 sectors. Now, I could say that the core portion of my portfolio is the S&P 500. SPY may or may not be the best way to express that view of the S&P 500. The SPY, in my mind, is an inflexible, monolithic investment vehicle that actually increases the risk profile of your portfolio and lowers your after-tax performance in meeting our clients' needs and goals. These are the 11 sectors that represent 68 industries that comprise the S&P 500. Each sector is weighted by the total size of the stocks representing each sector. But as you can imagine, each sector's performance is not the same. But what is really interesting is the wide variance on performance every year. As you can see, the SPY is a middling, middling 
performer when compared against all the other individual sectors. It should be, as it should be, as the SPY is just the average performance of all its sectors. But a closer look shows that there's a big swing every year in the performance of individual sectors. In 2015, energy was the worst performer, and in 2016, it was the best, minus 21 to plus 27 percent in performance. The one constant that is evident in the performance of the sectors is that every year the winners and losers are different. Investing in one or two of the sectors is inherently risky, riskier than investing in the SPY. Why? Because we could be wrong on the two sectors and the difference in performance would be dramatic. A portfolio with a core holding of the S&P sectors as sectors gives us the ability to change the weightings of the sectors in your portfolio so we can reduce your risk and increase your performance that is not available to you by just buying the SPY. Also, by using the S&P sectors, we can tax harvest, which is not possible when you buy the SPY. We never will be out of a sector entirely, but we will pick our spots based on high conviction that a sector should be weighted, overweighted, or underweighted. After tax performance, I will say it again, after tax performance. These words are our new watch words. They are the hammer that we will bludgeon our new competition with. Let's say you have $5 million portfolio. In your core portfolio portion, 40% of the portfolio is going to be in the S&P 500. You can express this view in four different ways without changing the risk to your clients. You can buy a large cap mutual fund. You can buy the SPY. You can buy the individual S&P sectors, or you can choose a direct indexing SMA. Now, direct indexing is the new frontier. Think about it as ETFs for wealthy people, or as a tool to help manage taxes and increase after-tax performance. Direct indexing is buy the individual stocks and index, and then use an algorithm to trade them on a constant basis to take in gains and losses. This is something that we cannot do as individuals because of time constraints. So instead of just looking at performance, we can look at after-tax performance. The average large cap mutual fund in 2016 incurred enough taxes to reduce performance after tax on the average by 170 basis points. This was the average. One of my clients said he had two mutual funds with over 10% in taxes. We are not talking about overall performance, as we are all aware that mutual funds underperform by about 90% of the time over the last 15 years. Then we can buy the SPY, which is tax efficient. No positive, no negative, but performs pretty close to spot on the index. Variance is minuscule, even if it exists. Next, we can purchase the 11 S&P sectors. Now, Betterment and Wealthfront sell a service where they where their algorithm trades the sectors for 25 bips, that's your cost, and they say that they can increase your after-tax performance by around 75 bips. Finally, you can buy a direct indexing SMA, costs around 30 bips, and increase your after-tax performance by 150 to 200 bips. Two years ago, the S&P was up like 13.69%. Parametrics, a direct indexing SMA, was up 13.68%. But on a million dollar investment generated $91,000 plus in write-offs. The largest order in parametrics this year was for $115 million to a family office that has a large private equity holding. PE kicks off capital gains. Parametric creates offset losses. Different investment vehicles for different people, but we never change our investment philosophy on the or the risk profile of the core investment. It is all the S&P 500. What changes is the after-tax performance. Smart beta, new term. What does it mean? What does it mean to you and me? The universe of smart beta investments is exploding, growing by over 4,000% year over year. We need to become subject matter expert, but, but with a critical caveat. We can no longer pick an investment because it sounds good. I like it. It makes sense. We no longer pick individual investments in a vacuum. We don't pick an index because it's simple and diversified. We build portfolios based on metrics. We understand our client's risk profile. 
we understand an employee and after-tax risk-adjusted returns based upon a client's needs and goal. We do not buy ETFs. We manage portfolios. Smart beta and ETFs means algorithmic screening process that make investment decisions based on value, momentum, quality, dividends, or volatility in a systemic and standardized rebalancing methodology. It could be multi-factoring, as in using several different screening methodologies or just one. A small cap value ETF is a multi-factoring ETF, small cap and value. What we need to understand is not only what is the past performance of a small beta ETF, but how does it affect my client's portfolio's metric, my portfolio's volatility, quality, risk-adjusted returns, and upside-downside capture. Before inserting a, a smart beta ETF into our portfolio, we should rigorously run several metrics to understand the impact. It's interesting, we just had Paul Singer come out and say that ETFs are anti-capitalist. He didn't mean SPY, he meant smart beta. Smart beta is outperforming hedge fund. What would you rather pay, 40 bips or two and 20? Yes, it's anti-capitalist. This is an ETF.com screenshot of the smart beta choices. There are over 1,600 ETFs. As the number of ETFs have been growing every year, the growth rate of smart beta ETFs is growing faster. The smart beta ETFs may not be bigger than AUM, but they are far more complex offering. It is not simple. It is not easy. And a lot of work has to go into which ones to put into a portfolio. This scan of ETF.com for smart beta ETFs shows the results of 804 different ETFs. How many different strategies? How many different algorithms? How does each one of these strategies fit into your portfolio, your risk profile, and help you meet your needs and goals? What are the effects of your risk-adjusted returns? Who's doing all the work to plug in the best choices for your portfolio? Returns are important, but risk-adjusted returns are far more important. These are the top 20 smart beta ETFs by AUM. Look at the spreads that the ETF trades at and the expenses. This is important because look at page 35 of the scan. Look at the size of the AUM and the spreads. A lot different now. One of these ETFs could be a good performer and you like their strategy, so you buy it for your client's portfolio. How does the inclusion change your client's risk profile and risk-adjusted return? The answer is, what do the metrics say? As many ETFs that are being newly created, there are many ETFs that are being wound down because of the lack of asset and because people just don't like the strategy or the ETF doesn't perform. If you own one of these ETFs that are unwinding, you lose control of your money during the process, you pay the relevant taxes incurred by the ETF, and you shoulder all the expenses of winding down the ETF. Now that won't happen to you, Mr. Client, Mr. Prospect, because we monitor your ETFs at all times and won't leave you hanging. Are you the client doing this? <coughs> ETFs are built by people. These people also have core beliefs or tenets of investing, and everyone is different with different points of view. Even if an ETF is run by an algorithm, a person wrote that algorithm, and all their bias and beliefs are inherent in that algorithm. ETFs are also built based upon an index, and an ETF follows the rules of the index. The view that ETFs are simple, diversified, and low cost is given the market and investors the impression that FAs are no longer needed in investing, or at a minimum, no longer need to pay FAs to assist them managing their asset. They are wrong. They are really wrong if they don't build a profit portfolio. An FA makes a difference. How different are ETFs? Vanguard allows you to know and understand the difference and express them to your clients. Vanguard has a product comparison process that's easy to use, but has powerful information for portfolio management. Let's look at the three largest dividend ETFs. Vanguard allows you to compare 10 ETFs at a time. A dividend ETF is a style ETF. You can build style portfolios or a mix of sector style and smart beta, also known as factoring. This is the three largest um, utility um, ETFs. 
two of the three have the same category, large value, and the other is large blend. Expenses are close within two bips. AUM, they're all large ETFs. There's no, they're not going to go out of business. This is a Bloomberg screenshot of the three TFs, not from Vanguard analysis. Vanguard was too small for us to see properly. Where there is commonality in each holding, each, TF, each ETF composition is entirely different. More importantly, the algorithm that each ETF employ are different. VIG is unlimited stocks, Schwab 100 stocks, iShares 75, and all based upon different criteria. Look at the iShares. It says they're based on morning stairs, morning stars quality metrics that boast a consistent record of paying good dividends, whatever that means. So which one do you use and why? The different portfolios had different yields from 2.6 to 3.39. Average PE, market cap, and sharp ratio are all very different. Look at the difference on the market cap. 86 billion, 53 billion, 173 billion. These ETFs are very, very different. And because they're different, there's different performance. But where the performance is relatively the same on the risk adjusted returns are different and the difference on the downside capture is stark when compared against the Russell 1000 benchmark. If you're in your 30s, I would argue VIG is appropriate. But if you're 57 or 58, it has to be HDV. The difference in downside capture drives the right selection. I had clients who used this with uh, two brothers that were ex Goldman Sachs people, both in their late 50s. They were told before the presentation they're competing against Vanguard at 30 bips. They went in in their presentation and they competed at 55 bips. When they went through this portion because their portfolio was 40% S&P 500, and 40% of a utility ETF. When they came to this slide, they asked the brothers, which ETF is appropriate for you? Both brothers quickly pointed at HDV. And William said, you know, we agree with you, but if you go to Vanguard, you're in VIG. The next day they got an email saying, very simple, you won the business, you won it on your presentation. International. We do know that at times the relative performance of international is more is better than the, than the U.S. performance. So if you're going to invest in international, how do you make these decisions? Well, we do a product comparison analysis. Now this team believe that they should be overweight in Japan. So if you want to add exposure to Japan, we had at least four choices: two are currency hedged, and two are not which one is appropriate for your clients or rather each individual client and their risk profile. Let's take a look. Interestingly, they're all categorized as Japan stock and two actually compare themselves against the same benchmark. They're all large in the sense of billions in AUM and the expense ratios are relatively the same except for the Matthews Mutual Fund at 99 bips. Again, looking at the upside downside capture against the MSCI Japan is where the difference arises. Where Matthews underperforms to the upside, it completely outperforms to the downside. The risk adjusted returns, again, is where Matthews stands out. Is it worth the 40 bips? What would a client say? Should a 40 year old client with a higher risk profile own the Deutsche Bank, Wisdom Tree, or the Matthews? Should an older client who needs and wants exposure but has no time to make up losses if the market drops drastically on the Matthew? All clients need to pay attention to risk-adjusted return, but especially older clients. They have no time to wait for the markets to come back. How do you build a portfolio for your clients and their risk profiles to meet their needs and goals? Building portfolios with the appropriate ETFs is our strength and our value add. Who understands our clients' needs and goals? Who understands our clients' <clears throat> our clients' risk profiles? Who does the research on the investment vehicles? Who does the metrics on the portfolio? Who builds after-tax risk-adjusted portfolios to meet our clients' needs and goals? We do. Let's talk about metrics. 
We never use them because our clients are invested differently. But metrics are our friends. Metrics becomes the hammer for us to bludgeon our competition. This portfolio is a core S&P 500 at 40% and 40% in HDV dividend ETF. Then tactically allocated with a slight overweight to Asia, Japan, we can run the metrics to show a portfolio how it is weighted. This client purposely overweighted to the emerging markets because of the belief emerging market are going to outperform the U.S. on a relative basis. Notice, this is not a portfolio that is now 50% emerging market. The portfolio is just overweighted. Is the right overweight? Performance analysis and metrics will tell us. Where does the portfolio allocation drive the performance? We know this by running the analytics. This is how we add value today and in the future. Metric-driven investment for risk-adjusted returns to meet our clients' needs and goals. The metrics tell us several things about this portfolio. There's a lot less volatility. Two, the portfolio is weighted to large cap stocks. Three, the hedge Japan generates 56 basis points more in performance. And four, overall, it generates an excess return over its comps of 1.46%. Are people willing to pay you for that? This is what I do. What do you do? The ABC Group actively researches and manages passive investment vehicles in a dynamic market to your individual risk profile to attain after-tax risk-adjusted performance based on metric to assist you in meeting all your needs and goals. Comparison analysis is a time-consuming but very powerful tool that we need to integrate into our investment process. We talked about the new sales cycle and the why. This is how we talk to our clients and our prospects. What is the best investment asset class to meet your needs and goals? Well, it happens to be the S&P 500. Since 1927, it's averaged 10% a year. Using the rule of 72, it means you can double your money every 10 years. Does the market go up 10% a year? No. Do we double our money every 10 years? No, but the market since March of 2009 is up 180%. We're only talking about averages. Generalizations are only true when we generalize. So the only question we have to answer is, what is the best way to invest in the best investment asset class for you to meet your needs and goals? Well, there are four ways, and each way has their own characteristics, which we then discuss in detail, but not today. Everyone here can talk for 20 minutes explaining all the pluses and minuses for individual stocks, mutual funds, SMAs, and ETFs. This is an actual comparison analysis by a team of mine from Wells Fargo. They manage around $350 million, and when, I, when we first met, they were 100% mutual funds. I asked them to take what they considered to be their best performing portfolio and compare it against the ETF portfolio that they developed. And here's the raw data. Remember something, too. This was their first attempt at building an ETF model. So what were the numbers in the end? There are five factors that clients care about. Performance, dividends, expenses, taxes, and style drift. This performance is based on pre-tax, not after-tax. This is what I would like you to consider. Yes, there is underperformance for the client, but what about us and our business model? Would you win this business if you made this presentation? This is what I mean by your investment model becoming a weapon, a weapon that can be honed. Look at the expenses. This is three years, $267,000. So what do you say to a client? He has a 10-year time horizon that in your portfolio, invested in these mutual funds, you will pay basically a, uh, on your $5 million portfolio, a million dollars in expenses and about seven or $800,000 in additional taxes. Is that a winning portfolio? Or does the ETF portfolio do better for you and the client? And think about it this way. If you invested 100 million in March 2009 in mutual funds and 100 million in ETFs, and you looked at them today, I would argue that the mutual fund portfolio 
and I'm being kind here, would be somewhere between 200 and 220 million, where the ETF portfolio would be around 280 million. Now, that's bad for the client, but what about your business model? Think about it this way. You have just left 60 to 80 million dollars on the table that you're not being paid for because of your choice of investment vehicle. Not the best business model. We must start inserting ourselves in the new world of ETFs. Far from being simple, ETFs allow us to step up our value add because we now can employ sophisticated modeling based upon an individual's risk profile and designing a risk-adjusted after-tax return portfolios based on metrics that meet our clients' needs and goals. Smart beta is value add. That is a learning process that we must embrace. I don't care if you think a smart beta ETF is a good idea. I do care what the metrics tell you about the effects of a smart beta ETF has on your portfolio. Metrics, metrics, metrics. Never stop doing metrics on your portfolio. It is a constant process. Engage your clients proactively. I get it. You may be opening a can of worms, but it's far worse than receiving an ACAT with no opportunity to engage. Trust your relationship. Trust your processes. Trust your metrics. On the back of my cards, I have one left-footed step per day. I think of FAs as the right-footed man lost in the desert. You work hard. You do the right things for your clients. You act in a professional manner. And five years go by and you find yourself right back where you started from. What happened? Nothing. It's the way of the world. Change is extremely difficult for humans. They say that 97% of change comes from fear, 2% because you have to, and 1% because you think it's a good idea. I always tell FAs, don't hire me if you think it's a good idea. Hire me if you're afraid, and then have a chance for success. To change... To to change to do one thing differently every day, just one. If you're going to work with a coach, ask them what are the problems that you're trying to solve for and how do they bring value to that process. PFGC, PFGC charges a one-time fee of $5,000 for a team and $3,500 for an individual. For the attendees at the SSNC conference, it will be $4,000 for a team and for an individual FA, it would be 3,000. We will standardize all your processes, articulation, presentations, discovery, wealth management process, and investment process. Everything is interrelated and independent. Nothing is left to chance. Nothing is a throwaway. This is your business. You are the CEO. Do not wait for certainty. Move on clarity. Thank you very much.